Welcome to our session titled An Introduction to Quantitative, Qualitative and Case Study Research Methods. As you will find further details in Chapter 1 of the textbook titled Market Entry Strategies. My name is Mario Bluvig. That is me in reality. Hello, nice to meet you. Okay, so then let's start with my presentation. So at the end of this session, you should be able to explain methods of qualitative and quantitative research, describe advantages and disadvantages of both qualitative and quantitative research methods, and to interpret and uh, to develop uh, case studies. The idea why I have developed this chapter is that um, uh, students, um, before they write their homework or bachelor or master or MBA thesis, uh, some of them are a little bit confused which method, research method they should apply, whether qualitative or quantitative, and that's why I have developed this session as well as this uh, chapter of the book in order to support and help you. Okay, so let's start with uh, Van der Veen, um, because whatever we do in research, we should always have the link to reality. So Van der Veen, introduced four research steps. First of all, we should design a research objective in which our research phenomena is grounded, and we should formulate corresponding research questions. I usually recommend to my students one or two, maximum three research questions, but uh, not necessarily more than three in order to avoid of getting lost. After the basic decision concerning the research objective and corresponding research questions, we have to conduct a literature review in depth and breadth in order to figure out what's available uh, in terms of the current research. And we have to think about alternative models. So for example, if we, um, if we would like to conduct research related to internationalization or international business or international market entry strategies, we may think about the Uppsala concept or the network concept, Born Global, New Venture concepts, or the eclectic paradigm, or the product life cycle theory by Vernon, or the internalization theory, and others. And um, as a result of our literature review, we then have to decide um, our model. Uh, we would like to base our research on and uh, to address the, our major research question. As a follow-up to the literature review, then in the next step, we have to conduct our own empirical research. We have to provide empirical evidence in order to fill the research gap we have found in course of our literature review. And last but not least, at the end, which is one of the most challenging um, issue, we have to clearly communicate and formulate how to apply our findings. So we distinguish between qualitative research and quantitative research. So let's start with qualitative research. The main circumstance why we uh, use uh, qualitative research. Um, this method is recommended, for example, when the research subject is new 
and therefore reliable data sets in larger numbers are not available yet. Research phenomena tends to be complex and needs to be described in depth. Qualitative research is launched based on variables that are difficult to quantify at the current status of research. And qualitative research requires an analysis aimed at formulating specific recommendations instead of developing general models, which is the, the key aim in case of quantitative research. So I usually recommend to my students to think about the Boolean equation. Uh, that means uh, based on our research questions, we have to think about our um, main research outcome. And this main research outcome is influenced by various causes. So the main research outcome is then the big Y. For example, let's assume we would like to um, develop a research project uh, describing um, a startup firm and the startup firm's internationalization process. So we would like to describe, figure out the performance of this startup firm's internationalization activities. And then we have to think about what influences this performance. And then we define variables. For example, one variable may is the, the role of the founding entrepreneur, uh, the entrepreneur's relationship to other business actors in the network, but also the knowledge stock, the international experience stock available um, at that startup firm. And uh, these variables influence the internationalization performance of that startup firm. We should keep in mind that um, uh, these causing variables change over time. That means um, it's always recommendable to conduct a number of observations over time. And the longer, the better. But of course, the longer we conduct research, the more resources uh, we have to reserve in terms of time and also money. And uh, that's why it's the basic decision of the, the researcher to find the golden way in the middle. That means uh, keep the, the time and the costs at a reasonable level, but on the other hand, make sure that uh, your observations uh, tend to be robust. And um, these uh, qualitative research activities should be, over time, should be always assume a ceteris paribus assumption. That means all other circumstances must stay the same. Coming back to our example of that startup firm, we may ask the same entrepreneur uh, over a period of time or we measure the knowledge stock in terms of uh, the management's internationalization experience over time. So we should uh, always um, come back to the same variables uh, to conduct our research. So the research design, the research framework should be always or have to be always the same over time. When we conduct qualitative research, <coughs> uh, we can uh, select between open questions and closed questions, for example, in terms of conducting face-to-face uh, -face interviews. Uh, the more complex the research phenomena, the less studied the research phenomena, uh, the more recommendable it is to consider open questions. Um, for example, we asked the entrepreneur, how would you describe your internationalization routes? What kind of markets you have entered first in course of your internationalization activities? What kind of uh, customers you are looking for 
um, and others. We also have the opportunity to uh, launch close questions um, and seeking to get the interviews answers. I assume most of you are aware of the Likert scale. For example, that Likert scale is ranked in between minus five, or we can do, we can rank it like minus five, which means uh, I totally disagree up to uh, plus five, I fully agree. So we may ask the entrepreneur of that startup firm, how would you rank uh, your performance in market A on a scale in between minus five and plus five? And then the entrepreneur may take the decision. Uh, minus five, I was, um, or the market entry was not that or was absolutely not successful and plus five means very successful and then the entrepreneur can take the decision in between minus five and plus five and then we get an uh, indication. We always should keep in mind that uh, the interview should have the, the possibility uh, not to take the decision. That means we may uh, provide a box uh, which is called uh, or which is titled uh, I don't want to answer or I'm not able to answer or we can have on a ranking in between minus five and plus five we can have a zero uh, which means neutral that is uh, very important from my point of view in order to avoid uh, any research bias research outcome bias okay so um, before we launch our main interview phase, we may think about a pre-study and hold mock interviews. The reason behind this, uh, we should, as an interviewer, we should make sure that the interviewees understand the contents of our questions, for example. That is sometimes a little bit challenging, particularly when, you, when we conduct uh, uh, international research. Sometimes there are some uh, language barriers, um, and um, that is uh, that is an advantage when we conduct these pre-study activities. Um, let's assume we would like to launch a main study of uh, two hundred uh, interviews. Then we may think about uh, ten to twenty mock interviews, and after conducting these mock interviews, we then can better fine tune our research design and reformulate, if necessary, our research questions. Okay, in comparison uh, to qualitative uh, research, in case of quantitative research, we always uh, use standardized and reliable data in larger quantities. And these data are available for statistical testing. And uh, quantitative researchers apply a so-called reconstruction logic, and they follow a linear and standardized research path. So quantitative research um, scholars uh, use formal procedure and research techniques and uh, quantitative research focus on measuring correlated variables seeking general causal explanations. So based on the availability of reliable data sets in appropriate numbers, the main aim of quantitative research is hypothesis testing. That means uh, we develop a null hypothesis, which means um, there is no difference in between, uh, for example, two samples in terms of variable characteristics. And um, the alternative hypothesis is then that we claim there is a difference in between both of these uh, samples. Quantitative research methods are particularly suitable for testing the validity and further development of a theory. 
And uh, when we launch quantitative research, we have uh, basically the following statistical methods. So we distinguish between descriptive statistics, descriptive and inferential statistics. Descriptive statistics um, are, for example, uh, that we uh, figure out frequencies, the mean, the median, analysis of correlations among variables. And inferential statistics uh, means that we launch a t-test analysis, analysis of variance, regression analysis, and uh, other quantitative research techniques. So both uh, uh, quantitative and qualitative research uh, come along with strengths. So in case of quantitative research, it's an appropriate method for hypothesis testing. It's useful for theory validity testing. Um, it uh, indicates a high representativeness due to larger samples. And uh, for that reason, uh, we are better able to make sure a statistical robustness uh, by measuring the correlation among variables. And uh, there is a high probability that this analysis reflects the population, at least um, when our data are significant. In case of qualitative research, um, there are the strengths, there are the following strengths, like it is very helpful for exploration of new research phenomena, less research phenomena and explain causes and effects of individual cases. So why, um, for example, as we took our case of the performance of the startup firm, we, qualitative research makes us uh, having insights why, for example, that startup firm perform very well or average or below expectation uh, in course of their internationalization activities. So we provide reasons through qualitative research. And qualitative research helps developing a new theory and uh, it uh, tests whether a theory is applicable or not. In case of uh, quantitative research, um, the, one of the major strengths is that the, is the data object, objectivity because the data are quantifiable and uh, it allows a generalization of the research outcomes. We can better compare and transfer the data sets and the research results. And it is relatively reasonable in terms of cost and time. In case of qualitative research, the advantage is that we understand the research subject in depth and breadth, and it better reflects specificity of business reality. We may develop concrete recommendations to business practitioners, for example. It's a relatively flexible research method and uh, better provides contextual validity of the research subject. However, both methods also come along with weaknesses, as for example, in case of quantitative research, um, the data are generalized. So they contribute to develop a common model, which is some which is, is an advantage, but on the other hand, we are not able to provide specific recommendations. And uh, this also is related to a limited ability to determine causation from results, research results uh, due to its quantifiable approach. It uh, provides rather less method flexibility. So basically we are we do research based on the data and the mathematical statistical formula and 
test methods we have, and there's a limited potential for specific individual recommendations for entrepreneurs, for example. On the other hand, uh, in case of qualitative research, there are uh, various weaknesses as well. It tends to be time consuming and therefore costly when we have to conduct interviews, we have to show up, we have to explain our uh, research aim. And um, when we uh, conduct uh, qualitative research, uh, there's always a risk that there is a limited potential for generalization of the research outcomes. Uh, the interviewer needs to have a profound, profound knowledge of the research subject. That means uh, the interviewer should have a certain minimum uh, industry expertise in order to be able to appropriately communicate with the interviewee and in order to understand uh, the industry dynamics, for example. Uh, qualitative research comes along with minor numerical indications and there's always a risk of subjective interpretation of the research results by the interview. Okay, um, case studies belong uh, to the most uh, yeah, uh, representative tools within qualitative research because case studies allow a transition between theory and, and practice. Uh, therefore, case studies are described as a useful tool for theory development because they are exploratory and descriptive by nature. And uh, case studies help identifying a new and often complex research phenomena. So through case studies, uh, we are target to examine an event or subject in its naturalistic context with the purpose of confronting theory with the real world. So uh, case studies provide opportunities um, they used to demonstrate whether a theory is applicable or rather lacks applicability, which can lead finally to totally disproving a theory. And uh, it provides a high degree of control for testing a new theory or comparing multiple competing theories. We can uh, conduct, uh, for example, a single firm case study. Um, we may seek to develop uh, or to identify benchmarks within an industry, for example, why a certain firm serves as a market leader or we may identify special and unique cases for example, we would like to endeavor why a particular firm uh, serves as a technological innovator and why another firm uh, serves rather as a technological latecomer. We can also figure out uh, worst cases, uh, not only best cases. So for example, worst cases uh, study is um, developed in order to figure out why a certain firm is not able to improve its service mentality or the product quality. And these worst case studies serve um, or are developed in order to learn from the mistakes of others to make things better. Uh, based on the replication logic, um, we uh, may consider to develop multiple case studies. For example, instead of just one single firm case, we may think about three or five firm cases or more, because uh, the more cases we have, the more we extend our knowledge. So. As a result, multiple case studies naturally provide a stronger ground for theory building than a single case study because the knowledge, the data we gain uh, are more robust, sustainable, and uh, provide more reliable information. 
So the larger the multiple case study sample, the better the prerequisites for findings and uh, findings in terms of common cause and effect relationships um, between the causing variables and the uh, um, outcome. And that leads to a higher degree of generalizability of the research outcomes. So built on a profound uh, and solid liter literature review, a case study relies on multiple source of evidence. So we uh, include in our, in our research uh, various kind of data and annual reports of companies, for example, on market survey data, statistics, press releases, interviews and observations. So we may follow up a structured approach when developing an own case. So first of all, we go through the ac academic literature, such as books, journals, conference proceedings, and uh, students' thesis. And then uh, we launch a secondary firm and industry sources, a research when we uh, investigate company annual reports, balance sheets, press releases, but also the official statistics such as of the European Union or International Monetary Fund or OECD or United Nations and others. Or we make use of data provided by commercial market research institutes. And as a follow up of the, the secondary research, we launched in the primary research. So we conduct then our own research uh, through face to face interviews or electronic or phone interviews. Or we uh, may also make use, suppose we have access to that uh, meeting reports uh, in order to gain some knowledge what's going on in, our, in, in that firm, which is subject of our research. We always should have in mind when reading or writing a case study um, that uh, there are a lot of case studies available in the literature, but um, we should question um, whether this case study really states uh, theoretical objectives and answers relevant research questions. How about the theory, the link between the theory and the empirical data? And uh, is the research methodology properly explained and in which information sources are used uh, for building that case study? We also should uh, consider when reading and writing a case study whether the research outcomes are generalizable for theory development and uh, whether or not uh, the case study allow causal claims for the research phenomena and uh, whether there are implications for management and business executives and of course, last but not least, um, whether this case provides proposals for future research in order to overcome current research gaps. Okay, so this is the literature I have used. You may go through as well. It may help you to find or that this literature may serve as a door opener for your own research. Okay, so I wish you most possible success when conducting qualitative and quantitative research methods. Uh, thank you for watching and uh, all the best for you. Take care. Bye-bye.